Hi, Pastor Matt Morton here, lead pastor of Cross Fellowship Church. Uh, before the message begins, I just want to take a moment and say thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, it is our hope and our prayer that by watching this video we uh, and hearing the message that indeed it can help you take one step closer to Jesus today. At the end of the sermon today, you'll hear me offer an invitation to the audience. And the invitation is simply to put your trust and your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you're listening today or watching online and you have never done that, uh, can I just encourage you to take that step, take the step to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Now maybe you have some questions or you just need to know more about that or even how to do that. At the bottom of the screen here is a telephone number. That's the church office, uh, please give that number a call. And if it's during office hours, the, the staff will direct you towards a pastor to help walk you through uh, how do you put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ. And if it's out of office hours, please leave a message and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, again, thank you so much for watching today and blessings. morning church. Yeah, so this morning we're going to continue on with our Vital Signs of a Healthy Church series. We'll pick up where we left off last week in the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 13. And while you're finding that, uh, I'll just let you know that uh, last time I preached, Bill, Bill told me that I preached for 19 minutes. So I've got rollover minutes. So I've got rollover minutes today that I'm going to take advantage of. So it's good to have you here. I would like to welcome a guest here. We have in our midst a Pastor Shadrach and his family here, if you guys could wave. Um, <laughs> Pastor Shadrach is from Kenya, and uh, we have the wonderful opportunity of um, helping him start a uh, uh, giving him a, a, at least a, a venue to, for a church here in the Springs specifically targeted to our Kenyan community. He's pastored in Texas for over 20 years at, in a Kenyan church there, and the Lord just led him to come up here and do the same because we have a large Kenyan community here. So he'll be, they'll be using our facility, in case you're wondering, uh, from about two to four every Sunday. Um, if you'd like to come and join again, another search church service, then there's an opportunity for you. So here we are at Acts chapter 13, um, and we're going to be uh, talking about the church being on mission, okay? So just like our mission team uh, is in Greece today, we're talking about the church being on mission. So if you would stand with me to read the Word of God, uh, Acts chapter 13, we'll, begin, we'll read the first 12 verses. Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then they fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them and sent them away. So being sent out by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, from where they sailed to Cyprus. When they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they'd also had John. This is John Mark, uh, the writer of the Gospel of Mark. He was Barnabas' cousin. It says, John was with them as their helper, and when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Barjesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for whose name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. 
But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, you who are all full of deceit and fraud, you sons of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist mist and a darkness fell upon him and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he had saw the, what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. May God bless the reading of his inerrant, infallible, inspired word. Please have a seat as you're joining me for prayer. Lord God, we do thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord, that we have to proclaim your word today. Lord, we know your Holy Spirit is in our midst. God, and so I pray that he would do the preaching now. He would just unloose and just let go. Lord, so that your truth may be proclaimed. Lord, I pray that he would move in the hearts and the minds of your people here today and move us into action and into courage uh, to exercise our faith. We wanna praise you, Lord, because we love you and we'll glorify you for what happens in this place today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. God's people said, amen. Amen. You know, so uh, the big idea for today is this. Wherever we go, our job is to proclaim Jesus to everyone. Wherever we go, our job is to proclaim Jesus to everyone. Again, and right here in our passage, um, three main things jump out at us. And most coincidentally, they're the three points I would like to share with you today of this message. The senders, the sent, and the field, meaning the mission field. And as a church, you know, we find our mission, Matthew 28, uh, you know, verse 20, in the Great Commission, right, where we learn to go and we make disciples. So if our mission is to go and make disciples, then what's up with Acts 1.8? You guys know Acts 1.8? I think we have it on the screen here. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and in the uh, remotest part of the earth. See, this verse describes how we are to carry out the Great Commission. We're told to go make disciples in in Matthew 28 and teach them everything he taught them, but here we're learning how we do it. You know, as you are going, everywhere you go, Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, everywhere, anywhere, we are proclaiming the Lord, and that's how we're fulfilling the Great Commission. Now, so let's look at the senders here, okay? This is the church at Antioch, okay? If you look way back at verse uh, one and two, you know, again, I'll read it again. We get a glimpse of the church here. Now, the church in Antioch, it said there was prophets and teachers. Barnabas, okay, we know him. Simeon, who was called Niger. Lucius of Cyrene. Manan, the lifelong friend of Herod. We'll get to that in a minute. And Saul. And they were worshiping and fasting. You know, that's kind of what they did there. Now, a couple weeks ago, we learned a little bit about the church of Antioch, how it began, and you know, the important role that God had assigned them in the history of the universal church. Uh, but we learned how the gospel was going to spread out from Jerusalem. Uh, but we never really learned the means or the motivation for why the gospel spread. But if you go back to Acts chapter 8, verse 1, you'll see that God used persecution to help the gospel spread out to the world. That's not a fun thought to think about. But you know what? Let me just say this. If you're not going to be an Acts 1-8 church, then God will make you an Acts 8-1 church. If we're not going to be about the business of making disciples wherever we go, then God, he's not going to allow us to sit here and to stay comfortable, okay, to be fat, dumb, and happy uh, sitting on our tush here in the church. He will bring, in, in this case, a persecution rose up. That's a scary word, persecution. You know, in in our English word, persecution comes from the Greek word thalipsis. It means to press together hard, okay, or to apply pressure. You know, when you hear persecution, think of, uh, you know, maybe uh, in the vineyards where they would stomp the grapes and press out the juice. Or in an olive uh, uh, field, they would do the same. They'd they'd press the uh, olives and get the oil out. You know, when, and whenever I'm reminded that the church spread through persecution, you know, I wonder to myself, how in the world did the prosperity gospel ever come about? 
You know, the, the church spread out of Jerusalem because the disciples were hard pressed. They were chased down. They were in prison and many of them were killed. I mean, Stephen was stoned to death in Acts chapter 7. That's what started it. And if you recall, this, the people who stoned Stephen uh, to death, they laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. The same Saul that's in our passage today. And although the prosperity gospel sounds good, it's just not accurate. I mean, God doesn't necessarily want us to be happy and healthy and wealthy. I mean, he wants to bless us for sure. But you know, these early believers, they fled to Antioch because Stephen was killed. And in chapter 12, we read that uh, James, the brother of John, was killed by the sword. Peter was thrown in jail. I mean, that's, there's not much to be happy and healthy and wealthy about that I'm reading here. And although persecution rarely happens in America, it still happens to our brothers and sisters around the world. And if you'd like to know a little bit more about how you can pray for the persecuted church, you can go visit the Voice of the Martyrs website at persecution.com. And there you'll find stories, just horrible, tremendous stories of how fellow believers like you and me are tortured and persecuted because they believe in Jesus Christ. And in our passage here, God gives us a picture into this church at Antioch. Verse one says, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, Saul. Okay, most of these names are gonna mean little or nothing to most of us today. But they are a much needed reminder of some clear, basic biblical principles that the church is made up of ordinary people. To you and I, we are the church, not this building. Okay, the word translated church is from the Greek word ekklesia. It means the called out ones. Okay, if you put your faith in Jesus as your substitute for sin, then you are called out. You are the church. There are many things in life I don't understand. There's many things in the Christian life that I don't fully understand. But please listen closely as I read uh, Romans 8, 30. For in those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, he also glorified. Maybe today you need to hear this. You know, you, can you just set aside the challenges that maybe life is throwing at you and listen to the word of God? You know, if you trust Jesus' death on the cross as sufficient payment in full for your sins, then this verse is for you. If the Holy Spirit may be urging you to trust Jesus as your Savior, well, this verse can be for you. Okay, this verse says that God chose you and me. He predestined us to be the recipient of his love. It doesn't matter what's happening in your house or with your spouse, or with your children, or at your work. God wants you, and he predestined you to be in his family. Don't let any theological arguments break your attention to, you know, and, and ruin this moment, okay? The secret things belong to the Lord. God called you a sinner out of darkness to be his child. He justified you. Then he wiped away your debt, your sin debt, and he nailed it to the cross when Jesus died. And he will call you to heaven one day, and you're going to have a glorified body, and you will be perfect and blameless before him. You see, you are called, one of the people that God called out of darkness to be his church. God didn't call the bricks and the mortar and the, and the wood, no matter how beautiful that is. He, God called us, just sinners saved by grace, to be his children. Church, he chose us. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, the church in Antioch is made up of normal people. Again, like, like I said, uh, it's made up of sinners saved by grace from different areas, from different backgrounds, from different ethnicities. This is by God's design. Saul was this Greek-speaking Jew from the city of Tarsus. So I think that's modern-day uh, Turkey, I believe. And he sat under the teaching of Gamaliel. Barnabas, that's not even his real name. He was a Levite from Cyprus. His given name was Joseph. But he was so encouraging to everybody around him, they gave him the nickname Barnabas, because he, which means son of encouragement. But who are these other people? Who is Simeon, Lucius, Manan? Well, we know from extra biblical sources that Simeon was a man of color. Okay, he may have been from Africa. We're not really sure because the Bible doesn't say. But maybe Simeon came 
from Antioch, came to Antioch with Lucius, because Lucius was from Cyrene, which was a city in northern Africa. Now, Menaean, Menaean's a very interesting person. Menaean is described as a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. That means it, it's Herod Antipas, okay? He's the son of Herod the Great. We know Herod the Great was the, the, the Herod, the king, when Jesus was born, tried to kill him, right? And now his son, he had several sons, but this particular son was the, Herod Antipas was the same one that where, where Pilate sent him to Herod and made fun of him and then they sent him back, right? This is the same Herod, okay? But he's listed among these believers. And some of the other translations say that Herod Antipas or Herod the Tetrarch was brought up with, or that Menaean was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, or he was a lifelong friend or brought up with, it has an even deeper implication. One translation says that he was nursed with him, with, with Herod. And if that's the case, Menaean may have been a foster brother of Herod or a very close friend. Yet here he is listed as a believer. This we know. The church is made up of people from many different races, ethnicities. The church is beautifully diverse by God's design. And racism has no place in God's universal church. The church is also made up of sinners saved by grace. Many people who we thought would never come to faith. I mean, Manan, for example, here, he was a hard case. He grew up with Herod, the same Herod who killed John the Baptist. Okay, also tried Jesus before his crucifixion. Manan was far from God. Maybe like you would, some of you were, or maybe like I was. But he put his faith in Christ alone. The gospel has that kind of power, folks. The gospel has the power to save even a hard case like Menaean. You know, in our, in, our church, in our passage, the church here is in action. The church was gathering and worshiping Jesus corporately the same way we are right now. Okay, uh, and during a worship service, just picture this, a miracle happened within the church. I know it's hard to believe miracles happen whenever the saints are gathered together. The Holy Spirit spoke. People heard him speak. And he called Barnabas and Saul to be the church's first missionaries. And missionaries are, are you know, they're called to serve God from within the church. And then the church deploys them and sends them out strategically. And God has blessed Cross Fellowship in this area too. I mean, we've sent out quite a few missionaries over the past couple of years from our church. And we've been able to come alongside several mission partners uh, to advance the gospel of Christ. And we have a part in, in sending missionaries to the ends of the earth. Our church gives approximately 10% of our budget to missions. Okay, that's our tithe. You know, uh, but uh, most missionaries actually garner their support from people like you who give individually to the missions, uh, to missions. And, the, and our, the church is also actively involved in missions by supporting those who go with the gospel. Okay, and we're gonna have our missions auction uh, here next month, actually, uh, donations uh, for the next three Sundays, just so you're aware. Uh, and and we're, we, we, whatever funds we raise, that's what we use to support those who are going uh, with the gospel. Look at verse three again. Here he says, then when they had fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them off. See, the church recognized how important this decision was, so they fasted. You ever fasted, you know, seeking wisdom and power from God for maybe an important decision? Fasting is not really spoken about all that much anymore, but it's a very powerful act of submission to God. See, when you fast, you're saying, God, I need spiritual sustenance more than I need physical sustenance. I need your wisdom, and I put you in the position of preeminence that you deserve. I need you. You know, whenever I felt God calling me into, you know, uh, he was opening a door for me to enter into being like a missions, uh, a missions pastor. I mean, it was such an important uh, decision for me that I fasted for a time before, while I was seeking the Lord's leading and guiding during that time. So fasting is one thing, but praying. Church, the church also prayed for Barnabas and Saul. You see, prayer moves the hand of God. He doesn't need our prayers to move it, but he wants us to, in, to participate with him. Do you pray for your missionaries, for our mission partners? May I suggest maybe that you or your life group adopt a missionary, maybe correspond in them, with them several times throughout the year? Pray for them. You know, whenever you're a missionary, there's so many decisions that need to be made. I mean, decisions about things that you may know little or nothing about. I mean, you fight loneliness, discouragement, homesickness, 
new debilitating diseases, depending on where you're serving, homeschooling, uh, challenges with challenging situations with coworkers. If you're fortunate enough to have coworkers in the mission field, I mean, you may visit a you may want to visit a sick family member here back in the states, but plane tickets are expensive. And there's a stack of government paperwork this big that it has to be done prior to you leaving so that you can enter the country after your visit. It's not always an easy thing. Our missionaries need our prayers to succeed. And when you take the step of faith and you start corresponding with the missionary, you earn their trust. You get to know them a little bit more. Exactly what are their prayer requests? What are their successes that we can rejoice in? What are their struggles that we can you know, go to the throne on their behalf for? You know, and we can actively lift them up to the Lord. The church is the foundation for missions because with, where there's, without the church, there's no mission. Mission agencies as, exist to assist the local church. Okay, We are the catalyst for this. And when we gather together like we are today, we're challenged to accept the Great Commission. We get training in evangelism and encouragement to walk with Christ. And then we're, we, we're discipled um, and we're disciplined in how we serve the community and surrender to, to take the gospel uh, out of this place. So we send missionaries to the field, we support them, we pray for them, and we even fast for them when the Lord leads. Okay, so just be reminded, wherever we go, our job is to proclaim Jesus to everyone. So we talked about the church, the senders. Let's talk about the sent. In this case, it's Barnabas and Saul, but it's anybody that the church sends out, right? And then both of these are great examples of changed lives. I mean, they left their friends and family to try to win a people to Christ in a culture that was full of animosity toward Christians. Barnabas was being asked to work with Paul, formerly Saul. I'm sure he, had, he was pretty leery about that at first. I mean, Saul seemed like such a hard case. You know, you go back and you read uh, Acts 7 and Acts 8 about Saul. I'm, I'm sitting there reading, I'm like, how can this guy be saved? I mean, I believe most of the Christians that he was chasing after uh, probably felt the same way. You know, in Acts 7, 58, we see Saul is represented, or he's present at Stephen's execution. I mentioned it earlier. It says they cast him, Stephen, out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their garments to the feet of a young man named Saul. So he was basically given approval. In Acts 8, he takes it up a notch. We read about Saul's zealousness to wipe out the church, it says, and there arose a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. Then you drop down to verse three, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering after house after house. He was dragging off men and women and committed them to prison. Then in Acts nine, we see Paul's hatred going, growing even stronger for Christians. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, asked him for letters to the synagogues, at Damascus, so if he found any belonging to the way, that's what they used to call us, thought we were some cult, then men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So imagine the, the miracle of Saul being sent out to spread the gospel because you know, he was gonna go to Damascus to persecute people, but it was on that Damascus road that his life was changed forever, took a dramatic turn and God was gonna now use this man who was perhaps the greatest persecutor of the church that ever was to be one of the first missionaries to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. It's the power of the gospel. The one who is killing Christians is now giving his life to spread Christianity. His new, his new life goal was to take the gospel to other people in other places. And that goal would lead him to make many, many sacrifices as he followed God's will for his life. And I, I just want to kind of mention that real quick. Um, if you look about but Saul's conversion uh, in Acts 9, I want to kind of go through this for a second because uh, I have a rollover minutes. Uh, here it says that now, th now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up, go to a street called Straight and inquire of a house of Judas for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for he's praying. And as he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, uh, Lord, um, 
I have heard about this man, how much harm he did to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings and the sons of Israel. In verse 16, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul suffered for the gospel immensely. <laughs> Probably more than you and I ever will, uh, hopefully. Uh, but that, this, this first miracle here is a miracle of a changed life, okay, Saul's life. But there's also the miracle of God calling men and women into full-time ministry. You know, verse two said, the Holy Spirit said to them, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I've called them. Can you imagine what it was like for them to be called into missions? Wouldn't you have liked to have been a part of that worship service? And you hear the Holy Spirit speaking up? I, I think it would be really, really, I mean, it's no less to no less amazing today when God calls people into full-time cross-cultural ministry. You know, but God doesn't often do it audibly anymore. I mean, most of the time he speaks to us through his word, at least predominantly. And in Matthew 28, 19, he says, go, make disciples. And many believers leave successful jobs and businesses and they sell their homes and uh, they move to an unfamiliar country or a city. And Acts 1, 8 says to you, you'll be my witnesses you know, in all these places. And many believers accept this call. They leave their families and friends and they go learn a new language and they embrace a new culture and they share the good news of Jesus. You see, the call to missions is so important. Missionaries are sent by the church, the launching pad, like I said, of all Christian activity. And missionaries need the support of the church to help them answer God's call to wherever they're, they're going in the world. So remember, whenever, wherever we go, our job is to proclaim Jesus to everyone. Finally, let's look at the mission field. After answering the call, they went to both Paul, Saul and Barnabas went out in verses three and four, or sorry, four, four, he says, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed on to Cyprus. And once they landed on the island of Cyprus, they began pre proclaiming the gospel. And this word translated as proclaim can also be translated as to preach or to teach or to publicly declare. The, see, the state of the world in the apostles' day was similar to that of our day in that it was chaotic. It was full of hate. It seemed like the world was spinning out of control. And Saul and Barnabas understood what a man's deepest and most profound need was, to know Jesus Christ and him crucified. See, people need the life-changing uh, transformation that the gospel brings about. See, when life is smooth and it's going well, people need Jesus. And when life is chaotic and violent, people need Jesus. It was true then and it's true today. So let me ask you, how are you doing are things chaotic and spinning out of control in your world? Maybe you're trusting Christ and everything's okay in your world. Maybe you know somebody whose life is turned upside down, out of control. And the life-changing gospel can give you or your loved ones peace in the storm. And at this point in Acts, the gospel is just beginning to spread out from Antioch. And today, the reach of the gospel spread out through the whole world, although there's still more work to do. I think last time I was, I was, when I was studying for this, I was looking, uh, I think 1,700 people groups have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1,700 people groups. That's millions of people still that haven't heard that, the gospel. Okay, so let's look at Acts 13, 6. I mean, right out of the gate here, there's opposition to the gospel. It says, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. I mean, I believe the Bible, it says he's a man of intelligence. I, just, I question his intelligence because he's hanging around with a joker like Bar-Jesus, okay? This man summoned Barnabas and Saul, and he sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them. He was seeking to turn this proconsul away from the faith. So please understand that whenever the gospel is preached, we should expect opposition. It doesn't always happen uh, openly most of the time, uh, but oftentimes it does. I mean, most of the opposition I've ever faced has been minor. 
But our brothers and sisters around the world face much more intense persecution, opposition, verbally and physically. I mean, our missionaries in Iraq are a perfect example. Um, just this past week, wait, two, it was two weeks ago, wasn't it, Cindy? Uh, they, they, they sent a text. They had to evacuate the town where they were at, uh, you know, because of harm. Uh, they, were, they were fearing physical harm because there was a series of terror-related bombings in the town that they serve in. And we also have mission partners in other places around the world where they can only use their initials when they're corresponding with us because they're serving in areas where they face so much opposition that using their real names could put them in serious danger. You know, our passage ends here in verse 12. It says, then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. We may face opposition when we preach the gospel, but let's remember the gospel is powerful and lives can be transformed no matter what kind of opposition is out there. You know, uh, I'm reminded of Romans chapter one, 16 and 17. Paul tells us that, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Folks, the gospel is more powerful than any opposing force, and we can hold on to that truth. So church, wherever we go, our job is what? Proclaim Jesus to everybody, right? What a, what a great challenge. Well, what now? I mean, how do we apply these truths to our lives? I mean, First of all, you can choose today to be actively involved in this church's mission. That means let's, you know, let's make gathering together for a weekly worship a priority. And if you're away on business or vacation and you're unable to gather in person, be sure to join our live stream across fc.org. I mean, it's that important that you get plugged in. This church is essential to missions. We're the launch pad, the foundation for taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. You can also, let's commit to pray for our missionaries. How about that? Prayer is one of the ways we can support them and encourage them. In fact, it is the most important way that we can help them. Why? Because prayer works. And are you praying for our mission partners? It's easy. Just decide today that you're going to pray for the missionary, whichever one that we highlight in our missions moment that we do every week or that we will be doing every week. I have some arms to twist on that one, okay? But you or your life group, again, you can also adopt a missionary that you'll pray for daily. And if you're not in a life group, get in a life group, okay? <laughs> Financially support a missionary. See, most missionaries approximately, I was talking to Pastor Breck out here earlier before, and he said 75% of financial support comes from individuals. Only 25% comes from the churches, okay? So prayer is one of, the, one of the most important ways that we can support them, but without enough money, they're not gonna be able to do it full time. You know, they're going to be able to support full time. They're going to have to run around. They're going to have to come back from the mission field, run around trying to raise money. And it's just, it's so much easier when, when the, the, they know that that part's taken care of. So have you ever, prayer, have you ever prayerfully considered uh, supporting a missionary financially or a missionary organization? Oh, here's a big step. Maybe God's calling you into full-time missions. I mean, perhaps you could be one of the missionary mission partners that we send out to the ends of the world, to an unreached people group. Some missionaries go straight to the field right after seminary. Those are the go-getters, right? And then some people, they don't become missionaries until maybe a little bit later in life when they have a family and kids. And you know, maybe it's a little bit you know, disruptive, but that's the way it is. And some people aren't called to missions until they retire. So you're never in the wrong stage of life to surrender to, to, to God's call to missions. And we have some exciting things that we're working on to uh, help raise aware, gospel awareness across fellowship. Pastor Bill's gonna share some of that uh, whenever he returns from leading the Greece trip uh, here in a couple weeks. Uh, but another step is we can serve God right here in our community. You can serve in our nursery or our children's program or Awana or Celebrate Recovery or you can serve Habitat for Humanity or how about one of our local missions partners or Open Bible Medical Clinic or Life Network, Springs Rescue Mission, Fresh Start Center. I mean, I, I just gonna keep going and going. One practical way, how about this, that you can serve in this facility is through our Christmas Blessing Store. 
that helps local families who are in need during the holidays. Need a little, little extra help. And stay tuned for the dates on that. Uh, make sure that you mark your calendars. I mean, I know there's a special, there's a list of special gifts that they need, you know, and it's fun. We come here and wrap gifts and, and uh, it's just, it is such a blessing. We helped hundreds of kids last year with that. So those are just some practical ways that you can take, the, take this message to heart and be involved in missions. So church, let's remember wherever we go, our job is to proclaim Jesus to everyone. No one is exempt from this mandate, okay? Let's be obedient to the work that God's called us to do, amen? Let me pray for us. Father God, we do thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord, to gather in your house today, Lord, proclaim your word. God, we thank you for this example that we have of a church that's on mission, Lord, where we can look to that example and say, that's what we wanna be like. We wanna be full of the Spirit, Lord, we want to be fasting and praying and, and worshiping and just have our hearts united together for one purpose, and that's to bring you honor and glory. And God, for into that end, Lord, I pray, Lord, if you're calling anyone here uh, to, to pray for a missionary or a mission partner, to financially support a mission partner, or to actually step up and put their life on hold and go themselves into the mission field, either locally or globally, Lord, to answer your call. Lord, just help us to be obedient to whatever it is that you are leading us today. And we ask you in Jesus' name, amen.